Hey guys, what's up? It's Isaac David and this is The Daily Disciple. I'm so glad you've joined me again for another review. You know, I love to do these things. I find a video on YouTube that seems like something compelling that we can, you know, discuss, talk about, whatever. Um, and I found one. One of the most interesting ones I've actually seen in quite a while. Somebody sat down, it's, I think it's the company's Anchored North, the YouTube channel. They sat down a progressive Christian and a conservative Christian and they talked about, well, you can guess it, of course, they talked about LGBT issues. When I heard that, I was like, I'm not super interested. I've talked about this topic before. But the interesting thing was, as I watched this video, I realized that I actually got into a lot more fundamental stuff in terms of sexuality in general. What is healthy sexuality, biblical sexuality, and also morality? What is where can we actually find truth and right and wrong? And it got into some philosophical topics that I know you guys are gonna be interested in, so stick around. Before we jump in, I just wanna give a huge shout out to everyone on Patreon. You guys know the people on Patreon are the people that make this thing happen. Without your guys' support, I couldn't do this. It's my goal to one day be able to do this full time and each person that joins on Patreon gets me that much closer to that goal. Thank you to the 40 of you who are on there right now. And if you wanna join, if you feel prayerfully led to support me and my ministry in that way, head to the link in my bio. So the guy in the blue is supposed to be the conservative Christian. He holds the traditional values of, you know, authority of scripture, marriage between one man and one woman, and sexuality is supposed to be taking place in that context. The guy in the black apparently used to believe these things, grew up in a Baptist church with kind of more conservative principles, but as he began to explore and really question these things, he began to move more progressive, get kicked out of the church that he was pastoring, and start a new church with his wife that is, you know, self-proclaimed a progressive Christian church. So that's just to get you caught up as we're entering this space and you're watching this video so you know what's going on. Let's watch. If I understand you is mm. that the only way that you can conceive of their being being some expressions of any behavior, right, in general, but uh, uh, but sexual behavior in specific, for you, the only way that you can conceive that there being uh, uh, differences between good and bad or better and worse is if there is an intelligent being that has thus declared it so. Is, am I understanding that correct? You're understanding it okay. exactly right. I didn't say it that clearly, but yes, if, if it's either, it's pretty stark options as I understand. If there's a designer, then there's a good design. If this, if this God figure is good, as I believe the Bible says God is, and so God is good. But if there's no designer, I don't know that there's really any hard and fast understanding of design for sex mm -hmm. then. And I don't know that we're really gonna be able to account for good and bad. Whereas when we come to the actual world, when we're looking at uh, child molestation or rape or sexual harassment or sexual abuse, right? Things that are prevalent in our world, or even let's not talk about criminal activity. Even just, I don't know, a guy being kind of slimy towards women in the way he approaches them sexually, thinking of them as sexual objects. How, how do I call him to any form of repentance if there isn't a design and before that is a designer? You know, it's interesting in the videos that I've done on this topic and kind of the conversations and dialogues that have taken place between Christians and sometimes like skeptics and atheists, you know, from a skeptic and atheist perspective, in terms of sexuality, it's like, well, we're just stardust that has evolved, so there is no ought. There is no real morality in terms of sexuality or design for sexuality. We kind of expect that. I expect that at least because, you know, as long as it feels good, do it in that kind of worldview. But when God enters the equation and he makes creation, it's kind of absurd to say God has no specific design for how sexuality was supposed to take place. But that's this guy's opinion, the, the, the guy in the black. This is his um, perspective is that God didn't really lay out any ought in terms of how we ought to conduct ourselves in the our sexuality. Like he just left that up to us in a way, which is kind of absurd to me. He's going to be appealing to all sorts of different uh, moralities and, and philosophies down the road here, but just know that the one that he is not appealing to is the Bible, which is ultimately the one, the standard that we should be holding to. God has given a design for healthy sexuality, the confines of man, one man, one woman in marriage. That is where sexual fulfillment takes place biblically. And, uh, and when we deny that standard, we're left with our own kind of like <laughs> confused murmurings, you know, and ramblings. And I think that's a lot of what we're going to experience here. 
Yeah, I think that question makes sense and the conclusions are somewhat reasonable within our context. But most of human history has not been in our context. So most of humans have lived within a world where it might have been the thought there was many gods or it might have been no gods, it might have been an animistic world where it's just hey, there's spirits and all things. My, my, my point is, is we've managed to, and by we I mean the collective species of humans, have managed to make it this far by creating sets of norms and values and ideas of what does contribute to flourishing and what doesn't without sort of concrete ideas about a god. Mm. So, I, so I don't know that, I guess that's a long way of saying, I don't think that the idea of God as a being out there who creates the laws down here is, is not needed for humans to figure out what contributes towards well-being and what contributes towards uh, destruction and chaos and sorrow and suffering. Wow, this is really interesting. I have never heard a self-proclaimed Christian argue this way. I've heard atheists argue this way. I've heard agnostics argue this way. Skeptics argue this way. I've never heard a Christian argue this type of morality because what he's appealing to here is some sort of cultural morality. He's saying God didn't lay it out in the Bible. God didn't, you know, we didn't need some God to tell us, even though he does believe God exists, I guess, but he, they didn't need God to lay out right and wrong, you know, good and bad because because over the course of time, we figured out what leads to most human flourishing. That is kind of the the uh, highest moral is what what kind of you know contributes to human flourishing. But that argument really breaks down because if we're looking at culture to define what is right and what is wrong, then what is one culture to say to another culture their culture is is wrong that is doing something bad? Easy example of this, and it's used all the time, is we look at Nazi Germany, right? They were doing what they thought was best for human flourishing, the flourishing that they thought was right to have one race become supreme over the rest because they thought that was what was best for humanity. How, who are we to say that that was wrong, right? Because it's just a culture gets to decide what's best for human flourishing. But that is so not true. It's such a weak and, and twisted argument because the average person that makes this argument, they see that example and they're like, okay, well, that was wrong. Why do we know that? We know that because two things. We, God's law is written on our hearts. And also, we've been exposed to enough um, cultural Christianity and the standards and values that that is, you know, associated with. And we, we internalize those things because we know those things are right, right? Like you're like, don't steal, don't kill, don't murder, don't, you know, don't covet. Like we know innately those things are wrong and people steal those values and just attribute it to, we're just figuring it out. You see, cultures will try to define what morality is, but that doesn't mean that their definition is definitive. Only in the scriptures will we find an objective standard for right and wrong. Appealing to cultural morality will only leave you in a muddled mess of absurdity because it is continually changing and shifting, especially with cancel culture. Things that were accepted five years ago, six years ago are now seen as atrocities and to be punished. That is not a objective standard. When we look at the Bible, we can say, this is what's right. This is what's wrong. We're not blown to and fro by the ways of the culture. Even if I did submit to you or submit that there was a God out there who had some sort of right and wrong expectation for humanity, which is not a premise I support. But if I submit for the sake of this conversation that that is a thing, how are we to know what that is? Know what God's will is? That's correct. How are we supposed to know what is right and what, if this sense of right and wrong does exist at a cosmic divine mm -hmm. level, how in the world are we supposed to know which is what? That is so wild. Like, I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not meaning like shame this guy for asking this question because I'm glad he's asking it, right? But just the mere fact that he's a self-proclaimed like Christian pastor and he's asking these very fundamental questions and he's actually making assertions that are exactly contrary to the Christian worldview in terms of him not believing that there is a God that has set, has expectations of his creation. Like he somehow believes there's a God that is completely detached from his creation. Like he, he has created us with no expectations, no morality, no right and wrong. And he separated himself from creation. It's a sad, sad worldview. Like I, that's not, I don't know how he believes that anywhere near resembles a Christianity thing. Like that's wild to me. How do we know very simply? Just one second. The Bible. 
the Bible. And you're like, well, the Isaac, how do you know, you know, what's, what's in the, how do you know if you're reading the Bible, right? It's like, well, we got to get to the point where we're understanding that when we read the Bible, we ought not be inserting our own perspectives and self, um, you know, presuppositions into it. You can read the Bible in a way that is, uh, you're reading it plainly. And so that doesn't mean you're taking every single thing literally in the sense that you're taking analogies like they actually, you know, happen, but no, you're reading it plainly. So you're able to interpret the Bible and people have been doing this forever, right? You're able to interpret the Bible in such a way where you can actually understand the truth. A child can understand the gospel. It's not that complicated. Yes, there's definitely pieces in the Bible that are more complicated to understand, but the bare bones, the, the bare gospel, Gospel. This shouldn't be something that we think is so high and mighty that we can never grasp or understand. No, a child can understand it. And we go to God's word that he has given us revealed in the scriptures. And you're like, well, Isaac, hasn't it been corrupted and stuff like that? Well, listen to me. If God is so powerful that he created all of us, and if God is so powerful that he raised Jesus from the dead, if God raised himself from the dead, like, oh my goodness, like, right, performed all these miracles, then God is powerful enough to preserve his word to us so then we can know him. And he has done that so we can know him. Uh, God being a speaking, communicating God, communicating through his word, giving us the Bible through human authorship, spirit inspired, producing Old and New Testament, 66 books from 37 to 39 authors. That's that, God's will. Right, but it strikes me as a, a pretty uh, tenuous setup at best because as we've already acknowledged, humans have been certain that they've gotten God right by using the Bible in certain ways only to discover that they were incredibly wrong. So how can we know that we have the Bible right this time on this issue. This is so interesting here. Notice how he keeps pushing at this idea. How do we know if we get it right? How do we, if we actually know? Because this is the crux of the issue, right? If if we if we're interpreting the Bible wrong in terms of sexuality, then that opens up the door for all you know LGBT issues, which is this guy's for. So he's like, okay, well, how do we know if we're not getting it wrong? How do we know if we're not interpreting the Bible incorrectly as Christians have done in the past? How do we know? And this is so interesting because it plays back into his, uh, you know, initial philosophies that he was tying to in terms of his understanding of truth, the nature of truth, what is right and wrong. Because we've already seen that this guy has nothing grounding his understanding of truth or objective truth. He doesn't believe God has set a standard for morality or anything like that. He's just kind of floating in the way of a worldview where there is a God that's created him and that's pretty much it. He hasn't laid out any standards of truth, morality, no way of actually knowing or being certain of anything. So how, how is he asking if we can know what the Bible says if he doesn't even believe in absolute truth? Because ultimately truth, in order for truth to be truth, it needs a standard, something we're appealing to, to know it's right or wrong. And God God is the standard. When people abandon that standard, they're left to their own opinions. And it's a sad, absurd worldview to hold. When you think about an issue like slavery, for example, you recognize that the, the Christians who supported slavery from the Bible were wrong, right? They, they had a wrong interpretation. So here again, we keep having this matter of a standard of right and wrong cutting into the conversation. In other words, we're not free to interpret the Bible however we see fit. As I understand it, we have to we have to understand it rightly. So if you understand and the how Bible, how do we right, know when we've got it rightly is my, is my question. When we understand the Bible as it intends to be understood, when we're not saying, you know, when Paul is speaking to the Galatians about salvation, he's actually saying pink elephants should dance on Mount Moriah in springtime. In other words, we all have to take authors literally, don't we? we? We say we don't like literal interpretation or these sorts of things, but if we don't take somebody literally as if there's a right way to interpret them and a wrong way to interpret them, we're in nonsense land. Even now, you and I are using truth. We're using categories of truth. I'm taking your words as if you mean what you say, and you're taking my words as if I mean what I say. In the same way, we have to take the Bible as if it's meaning a certain principle and reality. Yeah. Someone else can come along and say, no, it doesn't mean that. There has to be some kind of standard by which we say, I'm hearing you rightly and I'm hearing you wrongly. It's almost like this guy believes you can't have certainty about anything. Like he, he like in the whole world, like he seems very uh, averse to any, any kind of claim that you can know something. Absolutely. And I've seen types like this before. And I think this is a big kind of popular uh, philosophy to hold in your life or mentality in your life. It's like, 
well, this is what I believe right now, but I couldn't, I can't be certain of anything. Right. And it's almost seen as humble in a way, right? It's almost seen as like, oh, well, that person's just really humble and they're open, they're open-minded person. But honestly, it's actually kind of prideful. Do you know why? Because when you're saying, I can't know anything for certain, I can't know that for certain, I can't know that that for certain, whose opinion are you holding in most high regard? You're holding your own opinion in most high regard. You're like, well, I believe this right now, but if I determine it's not true anymore, then I will decide if a new thing is correct and a new thing is right. Instead of turning to who we should turn to and God and believing God, what you have said, God is true. And I can have certainty in that because I trust you over what I think over my own opinion. That's a true humility. To be prideful is to say, uh, you know what, God, I believe you now, but you know, if something's changed, I might change my opinion on it. That is all the ultimate sign of pride. Two things come to mind. One is Jesus's teaching that you will know people by their love in this, by how they love one another. Mm -hmm. um, bad tree doesn't give good fruit. Mm. Um, good tree doesn't give bad fruit. So we can look at the fruit we can look at actually what's being manifested in the world. We can look at all the fruits of the Spirit. Is there peace, patience, kindness, gentleness? Like, are these things being manifest here? If they're being manifest here, I think that's a that's about as close as a compass that we can get that, okay, I think we're in the ballpark here uh, because trying to know exactly what is right and what is wrong, um, I don't know that, we, or I do know that we don't have any way to like have certainty on that. We just don't. Um, but we can get close if we use What's, what is, what's the fruit that's being made here? Is it good fruit? If it's good fruit, then we're, I think we're in the ballpark here. Ah, what? Did you hear what he said? Uh, because trying to know exactly what is right and what is wrong, um, I don't know that, or I do know that we don't have any way to like have certainty on that. We just don't. He said he knows that you can't have certainty. Bro, what? And all of a sudden he is just, I'm sorry I'm getting amped up about this, but this is wild to me. He's just ex d disclosed his standard of truth. After this whole video, at the very final clip here, he's finally disclosed what his standard of truth and love and what the standard of sexuality should be or anything really. It's this idea of love, right? His own uh, definition of love. And if it bears good fruit, according to who? Him, right? Because it's not up to God. He's already rejected God's standard, but now he's pulling in this new standard that he's able to manipulate to fit his own ends. Because look, when we're applying his, when he's applying his standard, he looks to see, look, can, uh, in terms of sexuality, can, uh, you know, fornicating people be loving? Can that be a loving situation? In his opinion, I'm sure it's, yeah, absolutely. That can be a loving uh, situation there. So that's good. You know, check mark for that. What about polygamy? Can that be a loving situation? Can that be loving sexuality in his opinion? Sure, yeah, why not? Because that's that's love according to what he believes, right? And he's just cherry picked this thing from the Bible that he's manipulating. And then you bring it to homosexuality. It's like, can homosexuality be loving? Yeah, two people from the same gender loving each other. That seems nice. Okay. The problem is, is that this is just all this guy's opinion. Like, all of it. Like there is no string of truth or foundation for any of it. It's just this guy woke up one day and decided to call himself a Christian, but yet denies everything that Christianity stands for or any of the foundation for how we understand what Christianity is. I want to bring back to that one statement he said. He was like, we can't, I, am, I know we can't be certain. I know we can't be certain. And that kind of summarizes a lot of the arrogance that people have when they're making these arguments. They're saying, no, you can't know this. How do you know that you're saying is right? Like that's bigoted. We, you know, it's not, how do you know that? God didn't stand for that. You can't, there's no way. And they're so certain about it. And the, so they, they try to downplay the, the, the thought that you can be certain at all while having complete certainty that you're wrong. But it's the only play that they have have at this point when you deny God when you deny truth when you deny his ways you, you know you're kind of put in a place where you're suppressing all this truth and then your counter is to be so certain that you can't know anything especially about sexuality about truth about morality because if you can if you can be certain about something then that leads us right back to the scriptures 
And a lot of people don't like what's in the scriptures because the scriptures tell us a couple things. It tells us that we're all broken people, every single one of us, not just people that struggle with same-sex attraction, not just people in the LGBT community, uh, everybody, me included, for sure. That's why we need Jesus because Jesus came to this earth fully God and fully man to live a sinless life, a life that we could not live, to die on the cross, a death we deserve to die for our sins against God. He took our place. He rose again on the third day, defeating sin sin, death, and the devil. And what we are called to do is repent, which means turn from our sin and trust in Jesus. Jesus said that he's the way, the truth, and the life. Through Jesus, we can know truth. We can have absolute certainty in knowing that what he has declared is true. That is a freeing thing. That is not bondage, my friends. That is free freedom when we can understand. God has given us objective truth of what sexuality is, healthy sexuality, biblical sexuality, truth, morality, all of it, guys. And that is something to be thankful for. That's something to praise God for. And that is something that we can absolutely rest in. Well, what can I say? This video really got uh, pretty amped up, but I really appreciate you guys watching. If you want more content like this, um, subscribe to the channel because I'm putting out new videos all the time. I'm also very active on TikTok at uh, It's Isaac Dave. Also Instagram, same handle as well. You can follow me on there. And um, yeah, anyway, thanks for watching and I will see you next time. God bless.